Hi, this is Brian from Let's Code Physics. I sat down with Brad Moser of Physics Alive and Hamilton College and Ann Leake of High Point University to talk about our reflections on the 2022 winter meeting of the American Association of Physics Teachers. In the two hours we spent recording, topics included quantum mechanics, board games, quantum mechanical board games, representation in physics, and what we hope to see in future AAPT meetings. I've split up this conversation into six bite-sized episodes that we hope you'll enjoy. Well, at the um, the risk of going to midnight, it is it is eleven now. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've been talking a lot about quantum. Oh, I had one more quantum one I was going to mention, and then we. Could I have talk a about non. Some. I have a non quantum one. If you let's, want to, let's let's do a little non quantum for now, okay. and then there's there's one quantum one, and I'm going to have it be my last one because it was my favorite, um, just because of the things I like in my life. Uh, it was my favorite. It also happened to be the very last session of the day, um, but I'll I'll save that. I'll save that. So what is your non-quantum? So my non-quantum is um, incorporating climate change consequences and solutions into introductory physics classes. This is by Charlie Sakari of the Astronomers for Planet Earth group. Go follow them on social media. Um, I, I like that term in the, in the title, climate change consequences. I feel like that's putting it directly, but not putting it... Um, not, not hyping it to the point that students are going to disengage. But she, you know, presented this case about, um, you know, you know, obviously climate change is one of the most important applications we can talk about in a physics class. And she really drilled down to, let's just use this in these, you know, some of these simple problems that we, uh, that we do in class. So like she's got a sample question about um, average temperature of the earth Um, for 2020 was 1.19 degrees Celsius warmer than the pre-industrial average. How much warmer was 2020 in degrees Fahrenheit? And apparently students will come and say, well, it was 1.19 degrees Fahrenheit warmer because they think that the conversion is going to cancel out if you're talking about a temperature difference versus an actual temperature value. And so you can kind of use that to reinforce the notion of, well, what does the temperature scale mean? What does the unit conversion mean? And yeah, just how big is one degree Celsius in our more familiar degrees Fahrenheit mm-hmm. and kind of drive that home a bit better. Um, and she also encouraged a lot of, um, of like, like student reflection um, about like, like, like seeing this in their everyday lives. So she's got some articles in here about uh, Oregon's buckled roads and melted cables so you could do, so you could take you could take your you know your your thermal expansion problem or your or your heat exchange problem and put that in one of these contexts instead of doing ice in water again you could do it as cables melting on on power lines hmm. uh and you could use that as the context for doing the same type of math you're doing because obviously you're not doing the full-fledged climate atmospheric modeling, right? You're saying, let's, we see the evidence that this is happening. Let's put it into the types of problems we're already doing and make that the context for, again, teaching the stuff that is in the standards that we have to talk about. Nice. But again, you know, going out of the thing I harp on a lot, Hmm. you know, the, the climate science stuff, it's driven by energy. It's not driven Hmm. by free body diagrams. We're not going to F equals our MA our way out of climate change we're going to first and second law of thermodynamics our way out of climate change and so you know i i I always encourage people to spend a little bit less time on those free body Mm -hmm. diagrams and get to conservation of energy sooner well and it's also we're also not going to make any out of it by um conservation of energy going from gravitational potential to kinetic energy yeah Um, those are the easiest ones to solve uh (laughs) But there's a lot of other messy energy to to think about uh, that, and uh, yeah, it reminds me of some of the the energy considerations with uh, like energy theater and energy cubes, and and thinking about these different energy representations that can take on sort of these more complex pictures where you have uh, you know thermal energy and. But hey, that wasn't one of the talks, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to keep going that direction. Energy theater <laughs> is a cool thing. I did see a demonstration <laughs> of that one time. That's yeah. <laughs> so one of, one of the, the other very important topics uh, that 
that is a heavy piece. So I mentioned that the quantum mechanics shows up as, as a piece, but um, certainly the the ideas around diversity, equity, and mm-hmm. inclusion, and that is that is very present in this meeting. And um, the, one of the first talks that I attended was uh, from uh, many of the folks from University of Pittsburgh and uh, Emily Marshman was was giving this presentation on ecological belonging interventions to improve equity and inclusion in physics. And uh, I think the the early part of the talk kind of struck me like the, the way it was broken down that what what is um, what leads to students being motivated in class and when they're they're motivated they'll 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 do well. And it's uh, there were there were basically three main pieces and she spent a lot of time talking about those three pieces and how we can support those of the a student's self-efficacy, um, them being able to say, it's like, I can do it. It's like them being able to see that I can actually do physics and believe that they can do it. Uh, a sense of belonging. So, you know, this is especially prevalent for, for students of um, in underrepresented populations within our physics classes, but more broadly, uh, it can be anybody. There can, mm-hmm. Anybody can feel like they might not belong. Um, but uh, that was the second piece. And a third piece is the, the intelligence mindset, whether they, they feel mm. that their intelligence is fixed or whether there's that growth mindset piece. So it's, it's all three of these pieces. If we can help support students uh, with each of these and to help normalize their feelings. Uh, I think that was a piece that it's the way students feel is it's like, we expect that, you know, when you first arrive in college, for instance, you're going to maybe feel like you don't belong. You're going to, to feel like you're trying to figure out the way to fit in and you're not sure we can, you can do this to help normalize that. Yes, you, of course you feel that. And I, I want to acknowledge that you feel like feel that and to now help provide resources to help you feel more belonging, to help you um, recognize that you can do this. And, you know, she was speaking about different writing exercises you could do to help sort of reflect, you know, a lot of this metacognition piece that to, to sort of recognize this. And, and if you can then tap into those three pieces that can help now the student's motivation and to do well in, in school and yay. So that was, that was a, a, a wonderful talk. It was one that I, I attended for a little bit of, and then I wanted to hop to some of the others. Um, but that, those are kind of the main takeaways I, I, I took from, from what I saw. Yeah, I'll echo, it's, it's, it's good to see that the diversity considerations, they're being sprinkled into all sorts of talks. Like it's not just the PER session on diversity, equity, inclusion. And it's not just the panel of, women in physics that it's like, like, like on one, on one of the ones that I saw um, on quantum industry stuff, it was, you know, it was chugging along about the quantum stuff and then had a slide on. And here's what we're doing to make sure that in this new field of quantum information, we are making underrepresented groups feel welcome from the beginning instead of bootstrapping it on later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm excited. Uh, in, in a couple of weeks, I'll be speaking with some folks from the underrepresentation curriculum. Awesome. Uh, so, and I've used, I used a little bit of some of those pieces in, in, um, uh, in my course this, this past semester, but I'll be really interested to learn a lot, a lot more about, about that project and what they're, what they're doing. So a little teaser for folks who have Yay. made it this far, yeah. <laughs> yeah. a board game. There was a board game, the quantum party board game. And this was, yeah, it was, it was a session that started at, or the last talk was at 515. They were supposed to all end at 515, but I think, but there was one. There There's was one always time for board games, Brad. Yeah. Uh, so, oh, this looked like a, a fun one. So there's, there's a, a little board. You have these, these, these cats who have gotten out of their boxes and they want to have a party. So okay, it's just sort they... of a, lo- a loose little theme. Uh, and, and, um, oh, I didn't, I didn't write. I didn't write his name. I think I have seen advertisements for that. It's on my list of things to probably purchase. They, they started creating it in 2018, 2019, okay. I think. Yeah. And I think it's been yeah. out for maybe a year or so. And they've they've had some workshops on it already. Um, I might but, have seen it on a Kickstarter or something. But the, it's possible. Uh, but the, the, the premise is, is really kind of cool that it, it's trying to teach about uh, some of the basic principles of, of quantum mechanics about sort of the randomness and the probability mm-hmm. and that, you know, you get your, you, we, we know these things to be what they are because 
uh, it's empirical because we've done experiments, we've seen the data, and this is what we've seen from it. Um, so basically the cats that you were trying to score points for um, play by different rules depending on what card you you pull. And there's, there's four different sets of rules uh, for, you know, what were the experiments? For black body radiation, double slit, uh, photoelectric effect, and Rutherford gold foil. So based on the type of physics for each of those, uh, there's a certain different set of dice or a spinner that you use. And then based on how rare an event will be, if, if a more rare event comes up for you, you get to move your cat further and a less rare event, uh, you don't move as far, but basically the rules keep changing throughout the, the game. And so you, you learn about the, the fundamental quantum principles for each of these rules, uh, because that, that sets how you essentially score points. Um, so it looked like a, uh, a, a cute, fun game. I, I think they they mentioned that like it may be best for sort of like the middle school, maybe into high school age. But they said oh, it's great. like oh, our graduate students had fun playing it. So yeah. there's there's something yeah. for everybody. <laughs> yeah, because you with something like that, you either use it to introduce the concepts or you use it as a reflection piece to say where do you see the uncertainty principle represented in this game? Yeah, no, no, that's good for all ages. Yeah. So I need to have an episode on that because I've already got one board game episode, yeah. so I should, I should have another one. <laughs> so that, that's the, that's the last talk I'll, I'll, I'll end on. <laughs> so maybe we'll end on a forward looking question then. Um, you know, we, you, you know, you mentioned you looked over all the sessions, a lot of the quantum stuff seems to blend together. What would you like to hear about? Like if you were to carve out space in the next day APT meeting, and say, I want to make sure that we talk about this because I don't think we're talking about this yet. What, what would you like to see appear on the schedule? Yeah, one of the ones I've mentioned before, and I, I think we got into it a little bit today, is about, you know, what, what are the careers that people are going into mm. um, nowadays? Like, so you get a physics degree and you don't go into academia because that's most people probably. That is normal. <laughs> yeah, that's normal. What are they going to do? And what are the types of careers that we can be looking into the future to be helping to prepare our students for those? Uh, what are the types of topics we should be spending more time on? You know, less free body, gram, free body diagrams, more energy. Uh, right before the, 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 the quantum, quantum party game, I, I happened to catch the tail end of a talk and I, uh, I, I heard the speaker saying, it's like, yeah, you know, folks who, who work in quantum industry never solve the Schrodinger equation. And here, here we spend, you know, yeah. weeks solving for the hydrogen yeah. atom and learning Legendre polynomials and all, yeah. all, all these things. But if that's not being done, well, what, what are the key principles that we should be teaching? So knowing what are the careers people are going into and, and what's, what's the, the physics or, or data science or, or whatever it is they need to know that they really need to know so that we can, we can be preparing them for that. And this is going to go back to the age old argument of, you know, are we preparing students for careers in college or are we preparing them to be well-rounded individuals? And I guess, the, I don't know, the answer is yes, all yeah. the above. Uh, how, how can we, how can we go about all the above? We can prepare them for, for critical thinking by also using topics that are going to be applicable for their future careers as well. I think those can go hand in hand. So that, that would be one I would be interested in, in seeing a whole talk of here's a bunch of these different types of careers and people from from those careers. So not necessarily physics teachers, but people who are working in those positions and, and what they think is valuable. Hmm. So do you have some ideas? What, what's, what's one you yeah. would like to see? The one I would like to see is, is related to that, I think. And that is, you know, you, you know, you talked about, wouldn't it be great if we could forget the way we've taught physics for the last hundred years mm -hmm. and just kind of, you know, let's wipe the slate clean, get a Rosetta stone of everything we know about physics and design our curriculum from there. I would like us to see us have an honest conversation. And I think it would have to be that. I think it would have to be a conversation. I don't think this would be an invited session. This would probably be like a panel, a round table or something. But what honestly do we want the role of mathematics to be in physics education? Because mm. between the emphasis on model building and multiple representations and what you just mentioned of getting students ready for careers where they're not sitting down and solving the, the time 
independent Schrodinger equation, as if such a thing even exists in nature. Um, <laughs> you know, they're not sitting down and doing closed form analytical solutions. And with the advent and ready availability of com- computational resources in the classroom to circumvent a lot of the mathematical baggage. What, what is our actual relationship with mathematics and what do we want it to look like? Obviously we're not gonna abandon it wholesale because we still have this rich mathematical formalism that, that really does encapsulate what we know. But how do we go about interacting with it in a way that extracts knowledge in service to us instead of us performing algorithms in service to the math, mm. you know, mm-hmm. like, like, like what, what is the role of formulaic algebra stuff in a world with Wolfram alpha? What, what is the role of number crunching with a calculator in a world where I can import a Python library to solve just about any problem that I, that I put my mind to like, like, you know, you know, from, from, from high school physics, to defending your PhD dissertation, what, what do we want our relationship with mathematics to look like? And I, I don't think that has to be the same answer for every individual or even for every department or, or, or institution. I, I, I think there's a lot of room for a variety there. And I think that maybe that's where we open up a lot of the DEI opportunities is by saying, mm. you know, this track with this university, with this group, whatever, is very heavy on algebraic representations and this track is very heavy on computational representations this track is very heavy on diagramming you know and that we're all kind of we're you know we're all studying the same topics but we're expanding that tool set beyond well let's go back to the chalkboard with a piece of chalk you know and I, I don't know what those conversations need to look like. I have no idea what where we would even land on them. But I do know that we're starting to hear murmurs of that. And I would love to see that become an actual, you know, full-blown conversation. You know, if anybody from AAPT is listening and they have some weight, they're going to assign us to be the session moderators for those two sessions that we just proposed. All righty. Well, this has been this one. We talked much longer than I, I thought we would have. I should have known uh, because, of course, we can talk about physics for, for an hour. I thought, oh, oh a little yeah. half hour review. And we are the uh, luckiest people in the world, remember? <laughs> that's right. We, we're so lucky. And we're sitting up till 1130 at night talking about this stuff. This is, this is good. Uh, I'm kind of looking forward to, you know, in future years, I'll, I'll pick up a little more tech. We'll be live in meetings. I can just see myself walking around with the microphone, talking to people, uh, the introverts worst nightmare. Um, but <laughs> I, I, do I don't know how I'm going to do it <laughs> from the folks who do that in the geekdom world. You don't get to enjoy the conference if you do that. So mm-hmm. it is a wonderful, valuable service that you should get a grant for to fund yourself. Yeah. But yes, you won't enjoy the meeting <laughs> is what I hear. Thank you everybody for listening to this episode and this, uh, this banter. We look forward to our next day of reflections. And uh, until then, uh, enjoy your meeting and have a wonderful physics day. A wonderful physics day. I like that. <laughs> I guess it could, it can be a benediction as well as a greeting. Yeah. <laughs>